Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Henry Hale. I'm a professor of political science and international affairs here at uh, the Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies, uh, IRIS at GW, and also director of its uh, Petrock program on Ukraine. And uh, one of the things that uh, we at the Petrock program are hoping to do is to um, start bringing to Washington um, some leading scholarly experts on Ukraine to talk about their important uh, new books. And uh, I think we are uh, honored to have uh, Dr. Jessica Pisano here to uh, talk about her new book, uh, Staging Democracy, Political Performance in Ukraine and Russia uh, and Beyond. Um, so it is a, a book on a fascinating topic. She'll tell us a lot more about it. Um, I'll just note that she's professor of politics at the New School for Social Research in New York City and uh, has done a lot of just fascinating research on, I mean, I don't even quite know how to describe it, sort of the informal side of politics, um, if you might say, um, but it, it's more than that. Uh, I think you'll get a sense of that when she talks about it, um, but I think it's really important work. And um, we've asked her to open up with uh, some short remarks on the basic contents of her book and its implications, and then we can open it up for uh, discussion. And so I just ask people uh, online to, um, if you have questions, or comments, um, please share them in the chat and then I can read them out uh, to interject them into the uh, discussion. Um, but please, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks. Good, not, good afternoon, everyone uh, online and in person. And thanks, Henry, for the invitation and to the uh, Petrarch program at GW uh, for the invitation. So, at a time where there's so much good work uh, being done on Ukraine by Ukrainian scholars, uh, as well as so much work um, by Ukrainian scholars that remains yet unpublished um, or even uh, as yet written down uh, because of the demands of Russia's war. I'm particularly honored to be included in this series and appreciative of the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so Henry and colleagues, if you'll um, permit me, since this is a series about Ukraine at a time of sustained attempts to destroy Ukrainians as a people, uh, Ukraine as a state and the use of the Ukrainian language, I would like to take a moment to address our Ukrainian participants online and uh, for whatever posterity you, <laughs> you have online. Vitaio Vassik, Dujo Diakosho, Znešle Chas. Knižka stosuje se političnih realijih, realijih v sučasnoj istoriji i ki napevno že vam znajomi. Je možno tilki tilja hrati pohled z bohu. Але сподіваюся, що наша з вами сьогоднішня розмова буде все-таки корисною та цікавою для всіх. Um, I'll note for all that a Ukrainian language translation of Staging Democracy is in the works uh, through partners at IWM in Vienna and Academic Studies Press in Boston and Kyiv, and that translation will be open access. All right, so today I'm going to talk about a phenomenon we've all heard about, performances of democratic institutions. Uh, some people Sometimes people use words like fake elections or imitation referenda or demonstrations for hire to talk about these performances. Usually when people talk about them, they tend to do so briefly, dismissing performances as mere fakes. Move along folks, there's nothing to see here. Um, this has particularly been the case in the last year uh, when um, understandable efforts not to legitimize these referenda uh, have caused state officials to say these are, you know, these are fake events, we're not gonna talk about them. I'm here today to explain why we need to take these performances seriously uh, because they have and produce their own politics to understand how they work and how they change what people think democracy is. So staging democracy is about these performances in Russia and in Ukraine during pro-Kremlin presidential administrations. I also included in the book a few episodes from Trump era America to help us see the global potential of rule by this type of political theater. Um, I wrote the book after spending years watching these performances, not just from the audience, but from backstage. So over the next half hour, a little less, I'm gonna keep my formal comments to a minimum and then speak a little extemporaneously and speculatively about implications and then we can turn to discussion. I'm going to read a brief selection from the book, offer a portion of the argument, and then we'll spend most of our time talking about implications uh, for three countries, Russia, Ukraine, and the United States. So um, this is a recently published book. 
It's a new book only in a couple of senses. Um, I returned the corrected page proofs to the press at the end of January, 2022. And it went to press as Russian forces destroyed or occupied communities north of Kharkiv, where I conducted research for my book, The Post-Soviet Potemkin Village. Except for its very first sentence, I wrote it all in the before. So although I wish it weren't so, today I believe it's more important than ever before to understand how these performances of democratic institutions work. So I'm gonna take some time today to lay out what they mean and why they're important today in the after. Um, as I was saying to Henry right before we began, this is also a new book only in certain senses because I sat on it for a number of years, um, posing to myself a kind of Hamlet-like questions about the ethics of um, revealing um, information I believed was traceable even following the usual conventions of research ethics um, about interlocutors on both sides of the Russian-Ukraine border um, who I, knew would one day find themselves on the business end of Victor's justice. And I wasn't sure who that would be or what that would look like, but that I needed to, um, I needed to keep my thoughts to myself for, uh, for a period of time. So, um, so I decided to wait uh, for a while um, and made certain kinds of choices about the material I presented in the book. Um, and now that the worst has happened, I'm, uh, I'm talking about it. So, I'm going to start with a brief excerpt, which actually, as you'll see, may focus our attention away from Ukraine um, through analogy, uh, and then we'll talk about the argument. When I began researching this book two, two decades ago, Vladimir Putin had just come to power in Russia, and Ukraine seemed to be swinging pendulum-like between something like democracy, with an active and engaged citizenry, and a political order that felt like authoritarianism. In Ukraine, national politics changed dramatically from one presidential administration to the next. One group of politicians, when they were in power, implemented a liberal economic and political agenda fostering European alliances. The other group blackmailed political opponents, built machines, gutted scientific institutions, and appeased the Kremlin. When the latter group was out of office, the party seemed to recede from national politics, but really its cadres were busy building a, its agenda and support in the provinces for the next elections. Through it all, newspapers and television told Ukrainians that they were a divided, polarized nation. Some Ukrainian politicians did more to uphold democratic standards than others, but all were part of the same web of relationships linking industry and government in backroom deals that excluded most of their constituents. At the time, I looked at those networks from vantage points far from the national capital. The people I knew were farmers and factory workers, tractor drivers, land surveyors, and local functionaries. Even though Ukrainian national politics seemed to move to and fro, the basic challenges they faced as they tried to make a living and educate their children did not change very much from year to year. Instead, what changed for them was whether or not their bosses or suppliers or teachers pressured them to support politicians. Those demands usually arrived when the second group of politicians was in power, the ones who thought more of their personal relationships with Moscow than with their allies in the West. When those calls and visits and meetings came, people had to promise to vote for someone or get other people to vote for someone or take a bus to go demonstrate on a city square somewhere or show up and smile and talk about how well things were going when a delegation from the regional capital pulled up in front of the local town hall. Their job was to pretend to care, to make it look like they and all they supervised were exercising their civic right to express their political preferences. For people watching from the audience without a view behind the scenes, for a while, it all looked more or less like democracy as usual. But on stage, at paid demonstrations, and when people went to vote at their boss's request, something else was happening. People were starting to think about politics differently. They used to think programmatically, voting for politicians according to their ideas. Now, they were just picking sides. They were buying into whole ways of thinking and seeing an Alice in Wonderland state of mind, where the world on the other side of the mirror made no sense at all. As you might have gathered, Although these performances are among Moscow's unsanctioned exports, 
they can be staged in any country, including in democracies. So sometimes, as in 21st century Russia, there's only one stage and one play, and almost everyone's involved in it. But other times, in other places, you can have competitive elections in which part of the electorate is being pressured into performing rather than participating in those elections. So this is why I felt it was important to analyze these performances in countries as different from one another politically as Russia and Ukraine. Of course, today in 2023, it feels uncomfortable and strange to have a book about the two countries, right? Um, looking at the domestic politics, but um, because this is a phenomenon we can observe in both authoritarian regimes and democracies, um, it's important to consider both. So the reason these performances can exist across what political scientists think of regime type is that until recently, so in Crimea and the Donbass in 2014, and in other temporarily occupied areas of Ukraine in 2022, Zaporizhia, Kherson, they're usually not theater at the barrel of a gun. Instead, politicians draw people onto the stage using local economic compacts, quids pro quo over a long time horizon in which local leaders offer people something a bag of food, a daycare slot, a gas line, a successful medical procedure, javelin missiles, in exchange for agreement to show up and support a particular politician. That, by the way, uh, that exchange is known as pressure only once the cir circuit has been closed, when someone agrees to perform. This is when this is really this. This, so this is why, uh, if you think back a million years ago to the first impeachment inquiry, is why Zelensky said there had been no pressure when Trump asked him, asked him to do us a favor, though. Uh, the Ukrainian president was affirming his own integrity, not the absence of Trump's attempt to compromise it. So these exchanges are like traditional patronage, but with a twist. People can lose things they thought were theirs to keep. Their apartment, their salary, their kid's place in school if they don't cooperate. Because these exchanges happen at the local level among people who know each other and whose lives are often intertwined and because they involve networks of people, they're not simple transactions. For those who try to leave the theater, as a result, punishment can come from almost anywhere at any time. And we can talk about the psychological implications of that if we like. But right now I wanna say a few words about research methodology and how the methods we choose affect what we're able to see. Because these performances are meant to fool some of their viewers, they're hard to study using high altitude research. And by high, high altitude research, I mean the kind where um, you read and interpret from afar data that has been gathered and aggregated by someone else at the source. Or perhaps you might research when you might re visit regional or national capitals and speak with people mainly in leadership positions. So let's imagine if on the way from the airport to the hotel in such a capital, you catch a sight of a torn billboard poster for an opposition candidate. What's your methodology for interpreting your observation? If we take the observation at face value, we might think, oh, this looks like the ruling party in this country won't let the opposition speak. Or maybe we might think, um, as would be the case in the county where I live in New York state, uh, it looks like the supporters of the ruling party are pretty mad at the people who don't agree with them. But in both cases, we might be wrong. Conversations at the local party headquarters and with students hired to work there might reveal that the people who tore up the to posters are the same people who put them there in the first place. So using a practice political technologists call enemy of the regime, relatively less known candidates can make other people think they're important by ripping up their own posters. So in a world in which the creation of doubt is a strategic objective of some politicians, we need ways to study politics that account for that context. And so that's what I tried to do here. So to research this book, figuring there would be no reliable way to know from afar uh, why people had shown up to participate in a particular election or demonstration, I went to meetings where farm workers or small businessmen were told to vote for an incumbent president or lose their jobs or risk visits from fire inspectors or tax inspectors or what have you kinds of inspectors. I worked with students whose deans told them they would lose their scholarships if the dormitory didn't vote in the right way. Uh, or whose professors told them that their grades depended on them showing up for a pro-regime demonstration. 
And I rode a lot of rural buses where people whispered of cuts to bus routes or even ambulance service or even um, bread deliveries if villages didn't vote correctly. I also talked with stage managers of political theater. So I sat in offices awaiting meetings with mid-level district functionaries as they shouted at farm directors to deliver votes if they wanted that diesel for seeding winter wheat. I talked with heads of NGOs who accepted pressure from local bureaucrats to compel their members to vote in advance for particular politicians. In the research, I was particularly interested in the reach of the Kremlin and of the Ukrainian state far from national capitals. So I wondered, you know, did it matter where you lived for whether party agents could find and pressure you? So an to answer the question, I went to places um, from Blagovyeshensk, which is a city uh, uh, many places named Lagovyeshensk, but in this particular case, a city on the border um, with China and Russia in the Far East, uh, a place, by the way, with a large Ukrainian population, people who are the descendants of people deported from Ukraine under Stalin, um, all the way west to villages in Zakarpatia along Ukrainian's border with Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. Political theater is an ever evolving phenomenon as politicians try, citizens adapt and politicians try again, sort of throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? To see what'll, what'll work and then people find ways around it. So even as the dramaturgy was the same across both countries, so the story was elect the incumbent with a reasonably tight margin, right? All of my political science colleagues know that 51% uh, has been the new black for some time. Um, the stagecraft, and that um, with every electric change with every electoral cycle and the set design and blocking was different in every single city and village. And what I learned was that people within specific localities uh, had tremendously different experiences of political theater. So depending on the circumstances of people's lives and the pressure points that were available to local party agents, people in the same apartment block or village or workplace could have really radically different experiences. Some people led lives where almost everything was at the mercy of local stage managers. Um, you know, their job, their housing, their kids' place in school, um, whether their grandmother was gonna be able to see a doctor, you name it. And, and they would show up to support incumbent politicians whether they wanted to or not. And the, the possibility of doing something else didn't even trouble the mind as a question. Other people, meanwhile, um, employed in, um, service sector, pri private service sector jobs, or um, it's creatives, gig economy, um, living in certain kinds of uh, urban environments, so forth, could basically ignore the theater and vote their conscience and show up to demonstrations if they cared about the cause, uh, because there weren't a lot of pressure points in their lives. And often these two groups of people had very little knowledge of the freedom or constraints the other was experiencing. So in this way, political theater is less a reflection of people's existing political identities than a mechanism through which that identity is produced. So for those who participate, elections come to mean opportunities to express their loyalty. For those who fight against performances, you know, as on Euromaidan or in 2004 and five in Ukraine, elections continue to mean opportunities to express choice. So the practice of some political theater, even if it's not the only game in town, as a result can destabilize the meaning of democracy for everyone, dividing societies into people who think that you can show up to a demonstration to express your beliefs and people who think they must have been paid or pressured if you do. That's actually a perfect segue because I was about to say, I was about to say times have changed, right? So yes, enter the noise of, <laughs> of the current fog. So um, now would be a good time, I think, to think about uh, with you about the implications of these performances for democracy today. Um, these are speculative. So I'm just gonna offer uh, a few thoughts about Russia, Ukraine in both territory controlled by the Ukrainian government and currently not controlled by the Ukrainian government and then the United States. Um, and I hope the reason why I'm including the United States here will become clear as, as, we, as we talk about it. So um, what does this mean? What does the existence of this practice mean uh, for Russia and for Russia's war? Um, I think the most important takeaway from on this point is uh, 
from a policy perspective is that it's really important to give sanctions time to work because political theater works best when people still have something to lose, right? This is a, this is a practice that works in middle-class societies, right? Because if, if you wanna get people onto the stage to say, you know, yay, I support so-and-so or into the ballot box, um, you have to be able to threaten them with something. These are, I mean, there's some bu vote buying obviously in all of these, well, not so much in the United States to my knowledge, but, um, but in both Russia and Ukraine, we, see, we do see vote buying uh, in Ukraine up until a certain point, right? Decentralization really changes a lot of this. When Zelensky comes to power, a lot of this changes as well. Um, but, you know, the, the vote buying component of this is really, um, I found in any case, minor compared to the use of existing institutions, right? Leveraging existing institutions to make people, to compel people to behave in a certain way. So if you wanna think about sort of leveraging existing institutions, a useful way to think about this in the university setting is the idea that there are already hierarchies, right, that include administration, faculty, and students. Staff, I didn't see involved in this as much in university settings, but let's think about those three groups of people, right? Those hierarchies are already there. I don't know if this happens at GW, but, you know, where I teach, it's not uncommon if there's a conference, right? And you're setting up before the conference, like students might come in and help you move the tables, right? Or, um, you know, we all kind of do these mundane things um, in the course of everyday life just to, just to make things work. Um, and political theater and these kinds of uh, performances um, are sort of parasitic on those hierarchies and those practices. Students are used to listening to professors ask them to do things, um, you know, hopefully not things that are completely out of the realm of what's reasonable. But um, it's only an extra step to say, let's go out into the square in these particular contexts, right? Let's go out into the square and you'll, you're going to demonstrate for the president. Not asking you to look happy about it, not asking you to say anything, just, just go, let's go be there, right? And so, um, so it's very cheap for political parties to put this kind of pressure. It doesn't require extra resources. The institutions are already there. The hierarchies are already there. Uh, you just find the pressure point and leverage them. Um, same thing with other parts of universities, right? Where um, let's imagine we're going to lose our Pell Grants, right? If uh, if the students don't, if the people who live in this part of the city don't work and don't vote in this particular way, um, are all these different ways in which uh, existing distribution of resources um, can make people do things. So in the context of Russia, right? Um, the state still needs to be able to leverage things in order to compel participation. And we know, right, that um, without commenting on the enthusiasm with which people uh, leave for the front to go and kill the Ukrainians, we do know that the government is offering them a lot of money to go do it, right? Um, we know that financial incentives are playing a really important role in, um, in motivating um, contract work uh, by Russian soldiers. So um, I would suggest that it follows that at a certain point, right, um, depending on the health of the overall all economy, the ability to fund the institutions that are the places where this kind of coercion happens, um, you know, may deteriorate. And so you know, I think we all would have liked to see uh, a response from Russian society that looked different from what we actually have seen over the last um, two years with respect to uh, participation in the war against Ukraine. But um, to the extent to which people are responding to um, pressure, uh, it's possible that um, a change in the overall um, health of the Russian economy will in fact result in in less cooperation because of the ways in which political think theater works. It's a hypothesis and we'll see what happens. For Ukraine, why should we continue to pay attention to this? Ukraine's a democracy, the country is unified. Um, Zelensky's government is working to root out corruption. Um, people understand what they're fighting for. Uh, why would this be, why would this still be relevant? Um, I think this is relevant for a couple of different reasons. Um, 
the first being the next colonial wave that is going to, to mix metaphors here, break on the shores of uh, Ukrainian territory, which is to say that amid the economic stress, massive economic stress that this war is causing, um, people will be in a position where they may not feel that they have a lot of choices about some things. And because of the habitus, right, of this particular kind of practice among certain generations, when all the money that's going to come behind the war uh, arrives for reconstruction, uh, we can imagine people at a local level being sort of bound up in relationships with local uh, leaders who may or may not choose to use those tactics of pressure um, that were present previously. So, um, you know, one of the sort of, one of the problems with this particular kind of practice is that people can, it's easy to signal people to behave in a certain way. Um, and in some ways, one of the explanations for why this uh, this technique has been so successful in certain post-Soviet countries, right, is because um, people will behave without being told to do this because this is how we do things, right? Um, and I don't know that there's any reason to expect that for certain generations, those practices or response, condition responses are going to change um, because of the war. So that's sort of, that's a, you know, we'll see after victory, what will this look like? Um, one of the things that has changed tremendously in the last few years in Ukraine that I think actually, um, Vladimir Fesenko has commented on this a few years ago and others, um, that really, uh, if this practice continues or is taken up again, could be dangerous is a uh, dia, right? The uh, digitization of um, everyday life. Ukraine is far ahead, certainly, in the United States um, in the management of all kinds of different, um, uh, you know, paying your utilities, buying treatly, anything, anything you need to do in everyday life, you can pretty much do online. Um, this kind of information uh, available about people, if made available, right, um, to political parties. Um, who are not as committed to democracy as the current government um, could be something that uh, would not only um, produce the possibility of widespread coercion, but also uh, would be very difficult to observe, right? The types of coercion that are in this book, right? Go into a room and watch someone, right? Uh, trying to man manipulate students or farmers or whatever group you want. Uh, the electronic side of this uh, could happen well below, well below the radar. So I think that's something, a reason why, you know, it's worth um, remaining alert to this. Um, four territories not currently controlled by the Ukrainian government, that is temporarily occupied areas of Ukraine. Um, we know that these practices are ongoing. Um, we know that there is some resistance to them, but we also know that people have been put in absolutely impossible situations. And furthermore, that these um, practices socialize people to certain expectations about what politics are and what democracy is. Um, and undoing that, um, just as undoing beliefs that, um, all, the, all of the beliefs that the Kremlin would like people to accept about Ukraine is going to be like a massive undertaking, right, after victory. So that's another reason why um, while not wanting to legitimize the processes, the electoral processes underway in those territories, uh, it seems important to attend to the fact that they're happening and to the work of socialization they're doing um, among the people who live there. Finally, implications for the United States. Uh, I assume everyone in this room has heard of Schedule F. Does that ring a bell? No, okay, Sch Schedule F was an executive uh, order issued by, I was about to say decree, but uh, order issued by uh, Trump in, uh, I think, a week before the 2020 elections. Um, Schedule F means to politicize the federal bureaucracy, to take about 50,000 uh, career civil service jobs and make them at will employment that is uh, subject to loyalty tests um, to the executive. Now, Biden um, and all this, like, was one of the first things he did 
but um, there has been investigative journalism about this plan uh, that suggests that um, uh, people are working with the former American president to um, change the civil service in much the same way as the Federalist Society has to do for the civil service what the Federal Society has done for the judicial system. Um, uh, and so, um, and uh, Trump has made quite clear that this is one of his first uh, items on the agenda, right? If if reelected, uh, so most of the discussion of Schedule F has focused on well, what will happen to the FBI? What will happen to the EPA? What will happen to these sites of the so-called you know deep state, right? That will be made um, not a professionalized career bureaucracies, but um, sites of people who have shown political loyalty. Um, I would put it to you that the danger is actually much greater, right, than um, effects on specific policy areas, uh, because this is the way in which um, this starts, right? It creates what Russians call a power vertical, right? A loyalty based relationship between the executive and the bureaucracy that supports him. Um, which then makes it possible to um, ask us to, you know, do a favor though, right? Um, to ask for political favors, um, to mobilize administrations all the way down the hierarchy uh, in order to obtain desirable political outcomes, right? So, you know, the Schedule F is a 50,000 people. It's not it's a drop in the bucket overall. Um, however, it suggests, uh, as in as with many things with the previous American president, uh, a literacy in how this uh, this kind of system works. And for that reason, I think um, it behooves Americans to pay very close attention uh, to how these types of performances of democratic institutions work. Because as we know. Um, and as we saw in Russia and then in Hungary and, and Ukrainians have managed to, to push back against this effectively um, and in many other countries, uh, once the rules, the new rules are put in place, it's very hard to, it's very hard to destroy this system, right? It's very hard to get people to move back to a model of democracy that's based on choice as opposed to obligation or loyalty and for people to think about um, think about elections as, you know, as choice, or to even remember what choice is. Um, they also, as I mentioned, you know, when you destabilize perceptions in this way, where parts of elections look like they're fair, but maybe some people feel like they weren't, or maybe some people have received money to go show up at a rally, as we know is the case in the, in the, the, the when Trump was a candidate. Um, they come to believe that everybody is behaving this way. Uh, Americans are all familiar with the idea, right, or the accusation, oh, those, those demonstrators have all been paid by George Soros or, you know, whatever. Um, I would suggest that we need to look into why people are saying that, right? Um, because very often those narratives sort of end with derisive laughter or just moving on. Um, when people were making these accusations in Ukraine, in areas that were controlled by a uh, party of regions, they were making those accusations about Maidan in 2004, and then again with Yevro Maidan, um, because they themselves had been paid to do things, right? So that's what I see in terms of implications going forward and why this book is, I think, unfortunately, uh, you know, is worth a read in 2023. Um, and uh, I'll stop there and we can have a conversation. All right, terrific. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's, uh, we can open it up for um, discussion. Um, and uh, if you're online, you can just uh, send a question in the chat and uh, I can try to read them out. Um, I mean, maybe I'll just uh, lead off with one question. I mean, there's a, a lot of really fascinating uh, uh, remarks that you made and uh, I, I guess one that stood out for me was just, uh, you know, it relates to this bigger question of how this model of behavior can change and kind of change for good. Um, and, um, you know, you alluded to the influence of decentralization 
Um, and, uh, you know, the Zelensky uh, presidency or candidacy. So I wonder maybe if you could elaborate just a little bit on that and then we can, I'll take other questions. Sure. So um, for those of you who have not sort of followed Ukrainian politics uh, prior to 2022, <laughs> Um, the series of decentralization reforms that were put into place um, uh, after 2014 were kind of meant to break up some of the kind of geographical logic um, of these possibilities of um, kind of sending an order from Kyiv down to the down to the very local level to make people behave in a certain way. Um, so the idea was to um, you know, maybe participatory budgeting would be one American iteration of the idea behind decentralization, basically to give people in local communities from all the like more control over um, the money that comes in and out and, and the decisions that affect their lives. This was the, the idea behind this was to, in part, right, this was supposed to be a bulwark against separatism also, uh, because it broke, it broke the geographical or geo territorial logic. Um, of, of the administrative control here. So, um, you know, when I sent you the description of the, of the book and the talk, right, I emphasize that the book is about before decentralization because things change then. Um, and Zelensky, you know, his campaigns also change um, the extent to which these practices are in play. I mean, we also see shifts with Poroshenko before then, but, um, I'll stick to the, the parts of the story that I'm telling in this book. Um, and, you know, change appears to be possible through um, local level reforms um, that change the way in which, um, you know, state allocations happen. I will add also, and Henry knows, because I've, I've, I've written a great deal about um, the kind of symbolic contributions Zelensky made as a, as a stage performer and a television performer to, I mean, it's sort of, it's parallel to decentralization, right? What he was trying to do um, with his troop, which is to sort of emphasize um, and lift up local identities, municipal identities, right? To cut through polarization by emphasizing things that people could really agree on, like basic values and characteristics of, of of where people lived because people could have affective kind of attachments to those places, whether they, no matter what they thought about politics. And so that was also, um, I think a lesson for people living in the United States who are concerned about polarization because that's a way, the sort of decentralization localization is a way of breaking up both these machines and then breaking up the idea, right? Of these machines and the idea of a polarized politics in which, um, in which some people are kind of completely constrained by whatever politicians are trying to get them to do. And then other people, sometimes along class lines, right, have a bit more freedom um, in their, in the conduct of their everyday lives. So, so I think Ukraine in some ways offers a model for how other societies, other societies can break out of this uh, mold and break out of these practices, uh, if only we're wise enough to listen to it. All right, terrific. So the floor is uh, open for questions, comments. Yes, please. And if you could just identify yourself, thanks. Um, Alexander Haidai, uh, I'm here from university. Uh, you said about political theater and two different uh, like, positions, but why, why uh, what about uh, people who are playing the system? Like people voters who would take money yeah. or some peasants and they would vote for depends on uh, who, who they would prefer. So uh, if there is like a middle ground and people who are taking advantage of the mm -hmm. system because they benefit, but also they uh, because they have some um, like uh, their sense uh, uh, objectivity. Great, great question. Are you? Are you communist? Huh? Are you the author of, are you the Alexandra Haida of communist? Yes. Uh, it's, it's an honor <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, so what about those people? Um, what about those people? Indeed, um, I'm not sure. So I, I've encountered people in sort of both who think about this in different ways, right? Um, what uh, 
by the pineal two radical positions, yeah. Or against, right? What is the middle? In the middle, right? Um, so what Pani Alexandra is, 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 is talking about are um, the people who, for example, and this is not just individuals, right? I mean, there's a whole internet presence of, you know, how can you vote for three different people and collect the, the money for each of these three and still vote the way you want to? So, you know, instructions for using little bits of thread to like, you know, check and then take a picture, send it to your boss and get the money and then change the thread. So there are all kinds of different ways in which people would play the system. Um, so, I mean, I don't really know what to do with that analytically. Uh, there, there were also, I also, I'm sure that you, you know people who fall into the category as well of um, people who uh, feel very strongly morally, like they gave me the money, right? Like I, before God in my conscience, like I have to vote for this person because I took the money. Right, so like there's a morality of doing of participating in this kind of theater as well, um, in in like a particular you know um, moral economy. Um, so I don't I I don't know about systematic systematic events effects right of people who say well fine you know I'm gonna play the system too if you're gonna play me I'm gonna play you. Um, but I do, but I think this this example sort of falls into the category of those of this constantly evolving process, right? In which politicians are trying, and then people are finding ways around it, and then the rules change, and then I think it's one of the things that makes it hard to study and also hard to anticipate because um, because it's going to look very different, you know, two electoral cycles from now, um, because there's this constant learning. Right and constantly sort of more sophistication. I mean, one of the things that I talk I talk about in the book is this movement from kind of symphony orchestra step away from the theatrical model to a musical model, um, a sympathy sympathy a, a symphony orchestra to a jazz combo. Right, that it starts out as centralized and sort of orchestrated. Everyone's reading the score, like everybody is reading their particular part, and everything is highly coordinated. And then over time, it becomes like a bunch of jazz combos where, you know, the dramaturge is basically saying, do that. But then doesn't really know what's going on backstage, right? And this, th this raises a, an important point as well about implications for the Russian Federation specifically, which is to say that the dramaturge, right? Typically like the president, right? Or the president's close advisor um, like any dramaturge and then director, like the director doesn't go backstage, right? The director doesn't know what's happening there. The director sees what's being performed um, and can be fooled as much as any member of the audience. And so um, I think this, in some ways, this accounts for, you know, in Ukraine, why repeatedly over the last 20 years, right, there have been points where people outside of Ukraine said, oh, like nothing, you know, nothing is gonna happen. And then all of a sudden the country explodes into protest, right? Because, because we're not looking in the right places to understand what people really think. And the example you bring up is a, is, is a perfect illustration of this, right? That what, what do you do with the person who is playing the system? We don't know what people's preferences are. I mean, people who participate in political theater it doesn't tell us anything about what they think about leaders. Some people, you know, some people go to pro-Putin rallies because they like him, right? Other people go because they are being, but we can't tell from the outside, right? From without individual level information. So I'm not sure if that's what you were sort of getting at, um, but uh, but it, it gets at the sort of methodological problems of studying this as well, I think. Okay, great. Other comments, questions? Yeah. I thought, uh, I'm Elena Mochan, I'm a Patrick Fellow here and I was, and uh, I was thinking also about this, the words about what buying, and it's like uh, the, how political party changed their strategy due to decentralization reform and after Zelensky. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that a lot of scholars, they actually assess the standardization reform in a more positive way, uh, but um, maybe you also I can provide some feedback and uh, say something. Uh, what about like local elite culture? 
I mean, uh, this is the possibility actually that can happen in Ukraine. I mean, uh, because of this dominance of informal politics and practices. And now like a lot of uh, local political party, party actually they um, also took a lot of like position inside local governments. Uh, so, and I'm not sure like that they did not use this strategy of vote, vote by even like on this last uh, local election. So what, what can you tell me? Like, yes, well, I, uh, I, I can't comment on the last, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that I have insight to offer about, about the future, only to say that, um, in the United States, we have the Hatch Act, right? Um, theoretically, at least, there's a, there's a, you know, there is law that, that makes it illegal to use political office in this way. Now, Trump did plenty of, you know, violation of this, um, but there's a legislative framework, right, um, to ensure that um, that activity on the part of the political party doesn't happen while people are in office. Um, what we, you know, have seen in Ukraine over decades is that it all kind of depends on whether politicians want to do this, because if they do want to do it, they and do. I think they all like all the time <laughs> like to do it, <laughs> and you know, like right. the structure like allows to do that. Like in the US, right. does not allow like yes, and in Ukraine, right. it actually like allows to use the like personalistic uh, times, yeah. so like mentalism to do that. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a legislative framework, but I also think that I I think that the war is also having its own well, perhaps unanticipated effects, yeah. right? Because I mean, I am very involved with um, volunteer activity, and I have never heard you know the words conflict of interest so many times in Ukrainian as I have in the last two years, not because it's being practiced, but people are so worried of being, you know, accused of it, right? That, um, that I think, I mean, it seems to me that a lot of that, those practices, there's a possibility of change because um, concern about appearances so is so baked into, um, the sort of financial structure of this entire situation in which so much of, of the Ukrainian state budget is, you know, is going to have to be provided um, from outside of Ukraine because of the damage that Russia has done. And, and so that form of conditionality, maybe, I, I mean, I, I just don't, I don't know. Um, I, I really can't say that I know the answer to that question. So yeah, but thank you. we can talk thank about you. it, but <laughs> yes. My question is about uh, how can overcome uh, stage democracy in, the, in, in Ukraine and post Soviet space. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, political pluralism and pluralism of uh, political theater, uh, political stage. So. Uh, Success of Ukraine depends on a uh, competition of different political uh, different political stage. Yeah. So uh, in, in Ukraine, there, there is a huge difference with Russia, with one virtual yeah. stage monopolized by right. one center, and Ukraine with different political stage, right. with different actors, yeah. and with different uh, declarations. Right. So, and competition of di different decorations create de democracy yeah. in Ukraine. So, uh, what, what do you think about it? Well, I mean, I guess that, I guess if we project the past into the future, right, um, in which, I mean, this is something I, I talk about in the book, the idea that Russia has one stage, one play, Right mm -hmm. in Ukraine, there have always been not always, but in independent Ukraine, there have been not just different decorations, but a different story. Right mm -hmm. on <laughs> different plays happening, um, and some of them are not, uh, you know, not theater by compulsion. Right, they're 
it's not just pluralism in terms of competition among oligarchs and uh, and and people who obey them, but there are also there's a presence of of robust uh, democratic institutions um, and comp competition, uh, not just among people who are all going to election going to support the local politician, right? Who 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 wants them to go? Um, my concern here is that any stage creates the possibility of uh, destabilization. So I would actually say that it's not just pluralism, right, in terms of performance that's necessary. And here I'm using a definition, right, I'm using a definition of political theater that is not uh, the idea of politics as theater that we inherited from the ancients, right, but a very specific idea of what kind of theater, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think we need more than multiple stages and multiple plays. There needs to be also an understanding um, about sort of what we're seeing when we see or what people are doing when they're participating in, in theater, because as I believe we have seen in this country, in the United States, just a little bit of political theater can be enough to, you know, to ruin the whole thing. Um, it's not, you know, was it, it's Shavorsky, right? Who says that democracy has to be the only game in town, mm -hmm. right? In order to um, in order to be democracy with political theater, it doesn't need to be the only game in town. It just needs to be present um, in order to um, destabilize epistemological fields and to make people unsure about what they're seeing and to, you know, to undermine trust in democratic processes. So, so in the current moment, um, yeah, I guess we'll see. I mean, there's the whole debate about whether now is the time to have this discussion. I confess I come down on the side of people who say, let's wait to have the discussion. Um, but um, yeah, in the fog of war, I suppose it's difficult to say um, what competition will look like. But I, I don't know, I, at the same time, I have to believe that given, given the persistence of critique, um, given the persistence of democratic practice in Ukraine, notwithstanding all that's happening, um, I, I guess I, I have to believe that those processes are gonna continue. Um, I don't share the, the view of some American policymakers who are concerned about you know, authoritarian tendencies or something like that. Uh, I don't need to tell this group, right? Ukrainians have seen at close range and at unfathomable price what it means to have a depoliticized society. So I don't believe that Ukraine's going to come out of this depoliticized. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, thank you very much. My name is Amy Oppenheim. I'm a Richmond scholar at the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies on the sixth floor um, of this <laughs> building. Um, I, so I have two questions. Um, I love the idea that you're comparing, you know, the United States with Ukraine and Russia, and that the issue of political theater. Um, I'm wondering, it sounds if if your notion of political theater has to do with um, some form of coercion. I mean, essentially getting people to go along with a script that they don't really believe in. Or, you know, if I'm more or less summarizing your the way your your you know um, your understanding of political theater, but. What about, or maybe if you could just discuss to what extent do you see, you know, disinformation as part of the political theater where you don't have to coerce somebody because they genuinely believe it because they've been essentially the disinformation is what sort of is driving their behavior, which I think is, is has become, you know, disturbingly common in the United States that the role of disinformation, especially, you know, under the Trump presidency, but even now, um, you know, people don't have to be coerced because they really believe the election was stolen. Right. They really believe that, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so right. this is where I'm I'm just, and, and the second question, I know that you wrote yeah. your, your book before the full-scale invasion, but um, how do you see then the political theater? I mean, if you can, you know, I mean, you were touched on a little bit, but I mean, now in the temporarily occupied territories, the, the role of coercion has obviously increased exponentially. So how... I would, I would just be interested to hear if you could talk more about you know, what you're seeing there, what you believe is happening there, and how it may be different from before. 
right okay so i can say i guess two things in response to the two questions um the first is that so concerning people who are for whom ideology is important in explaining their behavior um other people are writing books about that right um so this book doesn't you know pretend to explain that piece of it um it tries to explain a political economic piece of it um you know that others in this room have have written about um but that uh that i believe sort of married with the theatrical metaphor can help us get better traction on what exactly can be going on for some people right um and also because the political economy story about this plays a role right in getting people onto the stage and part of what i'm arguing is that it's their presence on the stage that creates an identity group right it creates a sense of belonging which then makes them receptive to some of these ideas and so we can't ignore the political economy part of it because i think in some ways it's prior to the production of the cult like behavior that we see subsequently um but it's not to say that we don't also need you know idea based explanations for for what's going on there um as far as what's happening right now in temporary occupied territories, you know, I can't possibly pretend to have any idea because I'm sitting here with you. Um, the one thing I would say is something I would have said, you know, two years ago as well. Um, the idea of governing using political theater seems to be yet another brilliant strategic move on the part of the Russian Federation. Um, I mean that sarcastically, um, because successful governance using theater requires actual local knowledge, right? Of sort of who depends on whom for what, right? It, it requires local agents and, you know, possibly, you know, if people decide to cooperate, then, then, then the occupying forces would have that, but, um, it seems to me that the opportunities for resisting that type of manipulation must be present for uh, an occupying authority that has no idea what's going on locally, right? That has very little understanding of local economic practices, of, of, of who, who is important to whom, of any of these networks. Um, and so, uh, I mean, running this kind of show requires tremendous stores of local knowledge, uh, something that the Kremlin clearly doesn't have. And so, so I would have questions about, about whether, whether this is really a good, I mean, it might be, you know, it might be an approach to seizing territory, but keeping it, um, I guess I, have, I would have questions about that. But again, I can't possibly claim to know anything. All right. Well, uh, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we are at the end of our hour, um, but I uh, wanted to uh, thank you all for coming and most importantly to thank our guest speaker, uh, Jessica, for a fascinating uh, discussion and most importantly, uh, an important new book. So Thanks. thank you. Thanks. Yeah.